Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jason Marzak, the director of the Adrian Arch Latin America Center here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you for joining us for this incredibly timely discussion following the results of the Brazilian presidential election on Sunday. Uh, today's event were, is being held in partnership with the Global Business and Economics Program. Uh, Bart uh, Osterville, thank you for collaborating with us on today's event. Uh, also, for all of you joining by via web, webcast, uh, thanks for joining. Unfortunately, uh, we can't offer you empanadas if you're joining by webcast, uh, but thanks for joining anyways. And feel free also to get your phones out uh, only to tweet about this event. Uh, and if you're doing so, please use the hashtag ACBrazil. Now, let me let me start off and say a lot has been said about why and wh why jo Jair Bolsonaro was elected uh, president of Brazil and also what may be in store under his presidency. But I think critical to first take a step back. Sunday's elections and the campaign leading up to it put into perspective some of the country's most stark divides. As we have seen repeated in other countries around Latin America, around the world, this campaign was undoubtedly one of the most polarized and also controversial in recent history. Not to mention the role of disinformation uh, throughout the election, a uh, effort that the Atlantic Council's uh, uh, Adrian Arch Latin America Center and our Digital Forensics Research Lab have been deployed uh, in Brazil, monitoring and pushing back against disinformation. My colleague uh, Roberta Braga was uh, in Brazil leading up to the election, monitoring disinformation. Let me put into context Jair Bolsonaro's win on Sunday. As most of you know, he was elected with 55% of the votes, 57.7 million votes, a greater than 10% margin over Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. Haddad won in all nine states in the northeast of Brazil. Bolsonaro won in all in the 15 others plus the federal district. Most telling, and I'm not sure how, how much this statistic has, has been out there, but most tellingly, Bolsonaro won in 97% of the richest cities in Brazil. Haddad won in 98% of the poorest cities in Brazil. Like what we have seen elsewhere, the divide was sharp, and not only geographically. And those who supported Haddad or did not support Bolsonaro are now left wondering what will happen next. But first, why did Bolsonaro win? There's a number of reasons. Much of his appeal rested on being the, quote, law and order candidate at a time when crime rates in Brazil are incredibly high. Some of you might have seen the article just in today's New York Times on, on crime in Brazil, uh, and specifically in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Bolsonaro was also perceived by many Brazilians as one of the few candidates not mired in corruption. This in the midst of a public rejection of the political establishment following years of investigations that have placed some of the country's most prominent politicians, including, of course, former President Lula, behind bars. The current context, co Congress, before the October election, more than half of the country's senators and one third of the lawmakers in the lower house were being investigated for crimes. The circumstances were anything but simple. Running against the Dodd, some Bolsonaro voters chose him simply because he did not represent the Workers' Party of former President Lula, the party that in many ways is seen as responsible for the corruption and the mismanagement that has plagued the country. Now, one tangible sign of the seriousness with which corruption may be tackled is the decision to potentially offer Sergio Moro the post of leading a beefed up Ministry of Justice. This is the same federal judge who launched the Lava Jato investigation over four years ago and is seen as one of the toughest on corruption. I believe at this very moment while we're here uh, eating, eating empanadas on 15th and L, uh, Judge Mordo is uh, on his way to meet President-elect Bolsonaro in Rio de Janeiro to talk about a potential post in the Bolsonaro government. One additional point to keep in mind, and critical for today's discussion, is that Brazil is in the midst of tough economic times. Growth this year is forecast at just over 1%, and this follows years of weak performance. Three years ago, GDP declined by nearly 4%, 4 and two years ago, it fell by another 3.5%. All these issues help propel this to be what is clearly a change election. Now, beyond these issues, President-elect Bolsonaro is giving pause and generating anxiety due to his decades of comments in Congress and on the campaign trail around other key issues for Brazilian society. Issues of human rights, the rights of women, of minorities overall, and of the right to due process and the role of institutions. 
It's important to be vigilant if his government takes actions that undermine the basic underpinning of Brazilian society. And the role of checks and balances in Brazil will be critical in that regard. That's why it's critical to closely watch the early actions taken by the transition team and as of January 1 by the new government. These are all important issues to be discussed moving forward, and we at the Adrian Arch Latin America Center will approach these conversations not only pragmatically and critically, but also with a focus on helping to generate constructive and sustainable solutions. With that, we are here today to assess one key aspect of what Bolsonaro's election may mean for Brazil, and that's the possible or necessary economic changes that may be in store. With that, I'm delighted to welcome three expert speakers for a discussion that is sure to be top-notch and give all the insight that you'll need into what, what to expect in the Brazilian economy moving forward. So with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mauricio Mesqueta Moreira, Lisa Schniller, and Ricardo Senre. Please welcome to the stage. Welcome, welcome all, and thanks for joining. I'm going to each I'm going to introduce each of you briefly. Uh, the full bios were uh, passed out on the way in. Also, uh, unfortunately, uh, Marcos Troyo uh, was ultimately not able to to join us today. Uh, he had a conflict uh, that arose that kept him uh, in in Brazil and was unable to travel uh, to Washington. Uh, let me start in the middle with you, Mauricio. Mauricio Mosqueta Moreira is the chief economist of the integration and trade sector of the Inter American Development Bank. Prior to joining the bank, Mauricio held a position at the research department of the Ban de Asse, the Brazilian Development Bank, and also taught at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He's the leading author of a number of studies, one of which is a roadmap for a better integration of Latin America and the Caribbean, and also uncovering the barriers of the Chatham Latin American and the Caribbean trade. Welcome, Mauricio. It's great to have you today. Thank you. Next to me is Lisa Schneller. Lisa is the Managing Director for Sovereign Ratings at Standard & Poor's Rating Services and, uh, did, and, and actually flew down uh, this morning on the first flight from New York to, to be here today. So thanks, Lisa, for doing that. In her role at S&P, Lisa is responsible for sovereign analysis in the Americas covering key credits such as Brazil and the United States. She covers multilateral institutions, she covers the IDB, and also coordinates uh, with analysis regionally and globally on, global, on government related entities across the region. She served as S&P's Chief Economist of Latin America and also in the International Finance Division at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Lisa, great to have you as always. Oftentimes, Lisa will join us on, call, on phone calls, so it's always great to have you actually here in person at the Atlantic Council. Great to have you, Lisa. Thanks, Jason. It's a real honor and a pleasure. Thank you. And on, the, on my far left, your far right, is Ricardo Senra. Ricardo is a United States correspondent for the BBC World Service and also BBC News Brazil. He has years of experience reporting from Sao Paulo, Brasilia and the BBC headquarters in London. Ricardo was previously a news reporter with Forja de Sao Paulo, Brazil's largest new newspaper. Ricardo, great to have you as well. Thank you. We're going to have plenty of time for question and answers. I might even spice things up and, and go to questions in the midst of the panel. And then at the, after, at the conclusion, uh, Bart Osterveld will provide uh, closing remarks. I've also warned the panelists that uh, I like to com keep conversations fluid, uh, so we, we will uh, uh, um, uh, keep com keep comments to uh, uh, a short 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 as time as possible uh, to get across the key points. I what we're going to do is we're going to start with framing. We're going to frame the issue of, of why the economy is so important. Why what's what are the key issues that Bolsonaro will face? What are some of the key tests that, that he'll face in, in the economy? And then move on to specific changes that we could that might be might be uh, possible and also might be and also are incredibly necessary for the Brazilian economy moving forward. And then look at trade agreements, the potential of bilateral agreements, regional agreements, and uh, and what that can mean as part of the larger context. Now, as I said in the opening, issues of uh, corruption and, and security were central in many Brazilians' minds as they went to the polls this, uh, the, just this past, uh, past Sunday. And the incoming Bolsonaro government will be faced with ramping up Brazil's econo uh, economy, which has provided rather econo anemic economic growth in the last few years. Lisa, help us to set the stage. What are the ch key challenges that you see on the fiscal side uh, in Brazil currently? Sure. Um, th there are many on, on the fiscal side, and that is the key 
weakness for our sovereign rating on Brazil. You have debt that is um, about 60% of GDP, the way we, 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 we look at it, net general government debt, up from some 40%, you know, um, five plus years ago, going, keeping going, keep expected to continue to rise to about seven, over 70% in the coming <coughs> years. You have deficits that have been 10% of GDP several years ago, down to seven-ish now. That's the order of magnitude we're talking about. And a significant primary deficit. When you, you sw Brazil swung from primary surpluses, non-interest, um, fiscal balances, excluding interest payments, surpluses to deficits. Without um, additional spending containment, more robust growth, potentially recourse to taxes. You, this is going to be, th that's the only way you're going to turn around this fiscal story. The spending isn't particularly important given that you have spending, um, this cap, constitutional cap on spending that you, ideally you want to be complying with or, or there are going to be running into issues with the TCU, et cetera, um, besides good policy, right, right follow right. through. The pension, the level of pension gr growth, the rate of pension spending, the overall deficit, that feeds into that, as well as payroll. So this whole concept of a pension reform, very important, but you're going to need more than a pension reform. Yeah. And, we'll, and we'll, we'll talk more specifically about yeah. why pension reform has languished and what the potential is of, of pension reform. Mauricio, trade patterns. Um, how, how have some of Brazil's trade patterns influenced the, the lackluster economic growth that uh, Lisa is describing? That frankly, we so, I mean, this is this is lackluster economic growth for a number of years, going back uh, about at least five years. And walk us through how the export center has has attempted to respond as well to the commodity downturn, right, Maurice? I mean, you know, early 2000s there was such jubilance about the the growth in commodities in Brazil, and and that has of course languished. So how is how is the export sector attempted to respond to that downturn as well as uh, how trade patterns influence some of this lack of Australian economic growth? Well, thank you, Jason. Well, I mean, the last. 10 to 15 years, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the export, uh, export sector, I mean, exports in Brazil were totally driven by, you know, commodities, was, you know, the China uh, driven, uh, you know, that led to, you know, appreciation of the exchange rate. And, uh, you know, a, and if you add all the, the mismanagement of fiscal policy, interest rates, and, and all the issues of, uh, you know, business environment, you know, uh, manufacturing exports uh, uh, suffered a lot. And, uh, you know, a, a, and also, I mean, the, 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 the whole thing about trade policy, this idea that, uh, you know, you have to keep Brazil very m much protected from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, we, we definitely, you know, made some progress since the early 90s, but uh, since 1994, you know, we stopped, you know, this process of liberalizing the economy. It was so stopped sort of a midway through this process. And of course, if you have, you know, uh, average tariffs of 11 percent, you know, if you uh, add all the other incentives to produce uh, for the domestic market, you're not bound to see much of a you know export boom in, in things other than than commodities. Right. Uh, because I mean, if you can sell in the domestic market by 15, 20 percent more. In the case of cars, you can you know even go to 50 percent more than you can sell in the, the external market. You, you're going to bound to see you know a very uh, <laughs> uh, you know a, a, a modest uh, uh, performance in terms of uh, non agriculture, no mining exports. So Ricardo, Lisa, and Mauricio just laid out a number of different challenges. Uh, economic challenge has been faced for a number of years. Mauricio is laying out uh, uh, trade uh, challenges on, on the on the commercial side. Um, it would seem like we th th there should have been a solution. Um, why has why has reviving the economy? Why has this bedeviled previous administrations uh, uh, to address some of the challenges that that, that Lisa and uh, and Maurice have just laid out? Yeah, I, I guess another challenge or, or one of the main challenges Brazilian presidents have is a very well known word in Brazil, uh, which is governability. Uh, it's hard to be able to to find uh, support in, in a political system with more than 30 parties as the Brazilian one uh, has. And President Temer 
is a good example of this, I would say. When, when he uh, was brought to power, uh, he had a, a very good relationship with the, with the Congress. He was able to uh, approve very difficult uh, reforms such as the, the spending caps, such as uh, 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 the labor reform, a reform uh, in the education system. But that can change ver very quickly. Uh, governability is something very volatile in our country. Uh, for instance, the pension reform. Uh, he was able to pass all these reforms I've mentioned, but, uh, but not the pension reform. So keeping a good uh, dialogue with uh, the Congress and also with the society is a way to move forward towards uh, good results uh, in the in the economy. Uh, Bolsonaro was elected with 55 percent percent of the votes, mm -hmm. as you said. It was a large uh, margin uh, against uh, Fernando Haddad, but the abstentions abstention rates were also uh, very big. 42 million voters did not. Uh, choose any of the of the contestants. So um, having a good dialogue with the ones who did not vote for him is also something that uh, will help him in this path. Yeah, it's a, it's a really important point, Ricardo. The number of blank or, or null votes in, in this in this election was uh, incredibly high compared compared to, compared to previous uh, elections. Even despite the you know 57 million votes that uh, that Bolsonaro got, Lisa, I saw you shaking your, your head in agreement. Yeah. And I think that's an example of the discon discontent, the disenchantment with the political. You know, with established politicians, et cetera, in Brazil. So laying these out, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of I think, uh, expectations uh, of, of what a Bolsonaro government might be able to uh, accomplish on the eco economic front. What do you see, what do you see as, as, as some of the primary uh, aspirations of Brazilians that, that, that Bolsonaro might be able to uh, achieve, or frankly, his team might be able to to achieve, um, maybe in, in the in the in the in the short to medium term. I'll start with you, Lisa. I think that the the point I would want to highlight, and you set, you later put it out in your opening remarks. I don't view this the, the the key point on the front of voters' minds as looking for something transformative in the economy. It was the, the crime corruption, those were the driving factors. And you put those statistics out there, I think that, that certainly plays into the 97% voting right, for right. Um, Bolsonaro. But, and the 98 who voted for this for that figure for, for Hadaji, that reflects the fact that the poorer segments of the Brazilian population benefited from the Lula legacy in terms of greater macro stability in the earlier, in, in, in the early years and better policy at that time as well dovetailing with the global commodity price, com, uh, cycle where they moved up to the middle class. And that has staying power with that portion of the population. But I don't think people went to the vote, went to the polls looking for a pension reform or looking for a privatization. Right. Okay? Those may be part of the government's team's economic agenda, but they, I would not say that that was a reason for going to the polls for those, for, for, for President-elect Bolsonaro. So Mauricio Ricardo, given, given the fact that privatization, pension reform, is, you know, issues that are incredibly volatile, this is not why Bolsonaro was elected, what does that mean for his ability to actually move forward some of these very difficult uh, uh, economic transitions? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I usually I'm a pessimistic. Uh, we like pessimist. to be we like to be optimistic here, though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, I, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic about this this whole thing. Uh, you know, uh, there's clearly, I mean, there's clearly a, a elephant in the room when you discuss, you know, the prospect of a Brazilian economy, which is the the fiscal imbalance. Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal with that, I mean, there's no long term. I mean, we, I mean there's no point in discussing long term measures and reforms. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. And uh, I mean, I agree with, with Lisa that uh, this might not be the, the main issue of, of the election. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the people that voted for uh, Haddad, there was a lot of to do with the fact that, uh, you know, uh, they, 
the, the, some of the very uh, controversial remarks that uh, Bolsonaro has made about minorities, you know, all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, concerns about uh, uh, dictatorship, the military, so on and so forth. So uh, I'm not sure, if, you know, if they were just voting for that. Of course, the, there is the core, you know, the the militants that were, you know, still thinking of uh, voting uh, for him and they were pleased by the, the kind of policy. But but the rest of the people that voted for him it was more of a political than an economic thing. And I think that uh, you know this latest shock. I mean, this greatest recession we have in history. All the disruption we have seen. I mean, unemployment going to 13 percent. I think. I think there's, you know, uh, important lesson in terms of, you know, uh, what uh, what populist policies, you know, fiscal responsibility can do for the country. So I, I'm kind of, uh, you know, more optimistic in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, the population has learned not only, you know, on the specific fiscal uh, issues, but also, you know, all the kinds of industrial policies, local content, the stuff that happened to Petrobras, you know. Uh, you know, I think there's the lesson there that somehow filtered through yeah. to the, the, the electorate. And, uh, you know, and I'm glad that the, 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 the candidate that won was the only candidate that at least acknowledged that this Elephant was is the priority. Now this fiscal imbalance is the priority. The other candidate was still, you know, in this delusion that uh, you know you can keep spending your way through, yeah. you know, out of the the, the the recession, you know, and was sort of saying, oh no, it's fine. We're gonna, you know, die by spending more. So, let me let me ask a quick question to the audience. Who who has uh, heard Paulo Gates? Does, does that name is that name? Okay, so uh, about. What was that, about a third, uh, a third of the audience. So, um, so he's uh, gained some notoriety uh, already, and, and I think for the for the other two thirds who don't know him, you will quickly get to know this name, um, <laughs> Ricardo Paulo Gates, uh, chief economic advisor to, to Bolsonaro. Uh, he will be the next uh, super minister of the economy. Uh, I was dressed as, as Superman yesterday. I don't think he will have a, a, a cape, but he will be the, the super minister of the economy. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with Paul Gates, he was trained, on, uh, trained at the University of Chicago. Uh, he founded both a private equity firm and also a think tank for liberal economic policies. And his uh, free market outlook has really lended credibility to a Bolsonaro economic plan that, that has been door, endorsed by Brazilian international businesses and, and, and also uh, was at least uh, two weeks ago. I think the Wall Street Journal had had an editorial as well uh, endorse, endorsing uh, Bolsonaro <coughs> for economic, for his, partly for his economic plan, and I think that's reflected by by Paul Gates. Ricardo, what what can we expect from a, a Bolsonaro? First, what do you see as um, what, what, do we, what can we expect from the Bolsonaro Gates partnership, and how could that? What does that? partnership look like in practice? And especially for those who are unfamiliar with who Paulo Gates is, uh, what do you see as, 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 how, as the way in which that relationship will work moving forward? Yeah, as you said, he's expected to be this super minister. Uh, as you said, he's a Chicago boy, a very liberal, uh, as some say, uh, a very liberal uh, pro-privatization, pro-shrinking uh, of the state. Uh, economist. Uh, he, I would say, was the main uh, bridge between Bolsonaro's campaign and the international uh, uh, trading community. Mm -hmm. um, I have talked to a lot of investors here in the US. I have talked, uh, for instance, to Steve Bannon, who was uh, in the center of uh, a lot of uh, speculation in Brazil. Was he, he met with one of Bolsonaro's sons during the campaign. Yeah. Yep. And, and what he told me, uh, first of all, he said he was a supporter of Bolsonaro. He denied uh, 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 being part of his campaign. But one of the names that he's mentioned a lot during the interview was Paulo Guedes. Uh, he's, <coughs> He said that Paulo Guedes and the, the people who met him, uh, Bolsonaro's sons, for instance, uh, were traveling all around the US, talking to investors, talking to bankers, talking to people uh, at Wall Street, trying to create collectively uh, a, a platform, a, an economic platform, uh, listening to what these guys have to say about uh, how difficult it can be to invest in Brazil. So uh, I would say that Paulo Guedes was, is, uh, the main bridge with the the, the investment community. Uh, in the same time, uh, uh, 
they had uh, uh, different issues during the campaign. Paulo Guedes has once, has once said that we should privatize everything. Uh, and then Bolsonaro gave a step back and said, no, some sectors, some uh, uh, important sectors uh, should be maintained uh, in the state. For instance, the electrical one, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the core of Petrobras, for instance. So now we have to see how this dialogue will happen in practice. Uh, Paulo Guedes has just, uh, we were talking about this before, Paulo Guedes has just given an interview uh, 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 for the press uh, and uh, uh, a journalist from Clarín, uh, an Argentine Argentinian newspaper had asked him about uh, Mercosur, uh, what's the future of Mercosur, and he said, no, Mercosur is not on, the, on our plans, it's not a, a priority, that's what uh, his quote was, and uh, so he's shown but that some was, that was We were talking about that, that was in the context of a, of a larger interview, and most of the exactly. clip did not get shown to the to the Yeah, what audience. we hear is that the reporter was insisting on this, he was answering other questions, and then he came and said, and, and gave this answer, which was considered a bit aggressive by yeah. some people. So at least so does Bolsonaro, we we're talking about um, this, this, this super minister uh, and that Bolsonaro said he's really going to, I think he said something, I'm paraphrasing, that you know, e e e the economy is not Bolsonaro's strong suit and he's going to hand over you know, economic decisions to Paul Guedes. Does, does he really hand over um, uh, the, the complete economic reins to Paul Guedes? How, how do you see this playing out? That, that remains to be seen. And I, right. think, I think the key thing is in terms of successful policy outcomes um, that will, of course, depend on the economic team and the broader team, in the sense, depending what the policy is, right? So uh, the various ministers are all very important. But beyond that, the one person, right? Um, and we've seen the importance of those individuals across administrations under Fernando Henrique Cardozo, on, uh, you know, Pedro Milan, you've seen it with, with Pelosi and, and Lula, et cetera. So and you can keep on going, right? Um, but you also then need a bench below that, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where you had you, the, the Temer administration, not just at the very top level, but strong bench throughout various ministries at the banks, at the companies, et cetera, is more than one person. Then it's a matter of, does the administration back these policies, the, po the, the president and the political articulation and the interaction with Congress, and can you get them through? So all of those things are going to come to play. You know? So even if some things are handed over, right. can you advance those through Congress? That's going to be you know, the, 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 a key outcome. And that then, can you implement it? Labor reform passed, implemented, but then there's questions in terms of implementation that is holding back actual execution under the new labor law. So we're talking about the entire, you know, all branches of government here will play a role, not just one person. And, and, and Marisa, the, 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 the super ministry would have under its umbrella the Department of the Treasury, the Ministry of Planning, Budget and Management, the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, uh, state banks, the Brazilian Central Bank of Subordinates. Um, to, to Lisa's point, uh, what, would, what could be some of the consequences of the super ministry be for the priorities of, of other minis ministers and the ability for those ministries to, to work? You, you were at, uh, at, at, at Apex uh, a number of years ago and have served in and, and know kind of how, how different uh, government entities function. How, how do you see this, uh, the, 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 the kind of on the, the bureaucratic side to actually be able to get these, the various ministries under, the, mm -hmm. under one super ministry? Jason, I, I'm a little bit skeptical about this kind of solutions. I mean, it, it might be, you know. You're, you're, you're the optimist, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, as I said, I'm usually the, the pessimist, so I have to try hard to. But uh, in this case, I think it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, you, you make a big, this big announcement and, and suggesting this is going to save a lot of money. But it, it actually it doesn't save m much money at all. It might help in terms of unifying the message. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have been there before. I mean, with Zelia Cardozo, we had this kind of uh, super uh, minist ministry. And uh, it, it didn't work that well. I'm more in favor of, you know, trying to build uh, institutions in a way that uh, it somehow you have checks and balance. The way that uh, the things work these days is that, uh, you know, the, 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 the Minister of Trade and Industry is pretty much a lobby arm of the, you know, of the manufacturing uh, sector. 
a little bit of you know agriculture but uh, you know and they make the most of the decisions they have you know this uh, trade council where tariffs are set and other you know, trade policy measures and a trade remedy are set and they pretty much do it uh, on their own and and pretty much as a you know as a result of the lobby from from the private sector so I uh, would much, very much in favor if you, for instance, uh, start building, you know, independent regulatory agencies, including for for trade. I mean, anti-dumping has to be informed by, you know, uh, a very rigorous analysis of the welfare impacts yeah. of those measures, and then, you know, you hand this uh, information to the executive right. that, you know, has to uh, have some say on that. And also, I mean, uh, that's one issue of trade policy. I mean, the executive has. All the power in this case so what about the congress i mean right. if we have this you know uh, cycles of populism I mean, where the executive can you know reverse trade policy just by you know uh, a decree it would be much better also if you yeah. sort of share some of the power of a trade policy with the congress so this kind of right. institutional building uh, i think it's something that uh, you know would be much more effective in terms of yep. you know Toning down specific interests, you know, yeah. and, and, and Marisa, helping. I want, to, I want to drill into the role of Congress uh, on the next segment where we talk about privatization, pension reforms, uh, the role of the state. Uh, before doing that, though, Lisa, um, uh, I'd be remiss uh, since you, uh, uh, if I didn't ask about Standard Poor's uh, outlook on Brazil uh, and, um, uh, and 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 kind of and some of the the thinking behind the rating decisions that have been made in, in the last year. And on top of that, and I think this is this 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 is part of the same question. But if you could also then walk us through um, how the markets um, have reacted to the Bolsonaro uh, victory, which I think a, lo a lot of the victory on Sunday was already priced into the markets uh, beforehand. But walk us through a little bit on how S and P sees the the outlook for Brazil uh, and then and the market reaction. Sure, <clears throat> going backwards, I think the market reaction you, the, the real had strengthened from its weaker point early a couple of months ago. You know, and so it, that is, you know, remain steady-ish, right? You, a market participant might take a different view, but around the three-seven-ish kind of area, right? But the stock market performed strongly, et cetera. So I think a lot of it was kind of, it, kind of won the expectations given where the polls were going, but a sense that you have a a, a finance minister to be who will be, um, you know, pro um, private, pro, you know, reform. It, it, or advancing reform, we want to say pro-market, what have you, but you know, kind of tackling some of the issues. He stated some of the issues in terms of being tackled. How w will they be tackled? That's a separate issue, right? And that comes to the rating. So we have a stable outlook on Brazil's double B minus rating. Brazil is um, in the speculative grade, grade category. It used to be an investment grade. Uh, we brought it down a number of years ago and it continued to move lower through January of this year. That was our last uh, downgrade on Brazil, we, we wrote, moved it to double B minus with the stable. Why? Um, the fiscal burden, the growth trajectory very much weigh on our, our, uh, the rating and the outlook for Brazil. They were very much taken into account. What we were looking for is the you know, further progress on the ability to advance structural corrective fiscal policy. And despite initial attempts under the Temer administration that, that languished mm -hmm. against a backdrop of these high imbalances, which I outlined at, at the beginning of our, of our talk, the progress has been very slow. The pension reform languishing, and that was the chosen strategy. We're not saying you have to do that per se, it's not our role, but that was the strategy chosen to help make this cap more viable. The spending cap, the golden rule, we can get into the technicals and questions if you want, those are binding issues for Brazil's fiscal policy implementation. The lack of space in the budget, um, increasingly problematic. You need to tackle rigid spending items. How do you do that? that and you haven't had progress. And that's from political pushback at the end of the day, inability to advance. We expected, moving forward, the progress to continue to be slow, irrespective of who won the election. That's why we took the rating down in January. Because of these entrenched resistance, the fact that you could likely have some, someone win with less experience in building coalitions because of the push against established politicians. 
um, and or whoever won would be tackling a more polarized environment to advance and, and policy advancement will just be on the margin somewhat slower. Mm -hmm. So that's taken into account in our rating. Interesting. Advancement, uh, but slower advancement. Yeah, right. So the expectation, as we were talking about, that some of some of the the key reforms um, do not move forward as as quickly as is necessary, or less that's profound. And less profound. That's already that's already been figured in your rating. To that's a certain degree, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. We're not including slippage. We're not including right. backsliding, right. for example. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to move on to pension reform. Um, I guess a, a, another quick poll. Um, Who's, who's optimistic about the potential of pension reform in, in Brazil? Who thinks it's important, I guess? Let me start off with who thinks it's, who thinks it's critical. Okay, everyone thinks it's critical. Who's optimistic about it? What, one, two, two people, can I, can, I, can I just ask you, in the, in the, I saw your hand in the fourth row. Um, can I just ask you uh, just a quick, what, what, why you're optimistic? Yeah, do you mind? Uh, no. it, it just state your name, please. Greg. Um, optimistic, in, optimistic in the sense that optimistic in the sense that something will be done, something has to be done. Optimistic in the sense that we'll, we'll cure the problem. No, but optimistic in the sense that something will be done like the first six months. Okay, great. Thanks, Greg. So optimistic something will be done like in the first six months. And and everybody thinks it's important because the current system, um, this pay as you go system in Brazil is is unsustainable, right? I mean, it's unsustainable due to demography reasons, the huge benefits. Um, Pablo Gaius said earlier this week that uh, our, our, there's quite a quote here, our, our quote, our pension funds are an airplane with five bombs on board that will explode at any moment, uh, end quote. And he urged for pension reform this year, but we're about the short timeline. As Greg said, you know, there's maybe, hope maybe there's this potential of getting something in the, in the, in the first <coughs> six months of, of next year. Um, Ricardo, how how does how does a pension reform move forward? How do we get a pension reform, you know, in the in the in the first you know six months of uh, of, of of 2019? And do you see that as viable? Um, again, I think it has to do with uh, the uh, ability of Mr. Bolsonaro to engage with the Congress and to to keep a good dialogue with those guys, and. I would add the pension reform uh, is uh, a, c a consensus in Brazil. The, the uh, uh, Fernando Haddad was also supporting a, a sort of pension reform. We don't know exactly well, how that would be, but uh, there are some kinds of taboos in this issue. For instance, the military uh, pension reform, which is something very sensitive for Bolsonaro since he's a, a, a captain, someone uh, very supportive for, for the army. I brought some, some numbers here. Uh, the deficit on the military pensions, according to the government, is 43.3 uh, billion Brazilian reais from a total of tr more than 300 billion uh, uh, deficit. It's a big slice, uh, but touching this could irritate part of Bolsonaro's uh, supporting basis. What we heard, though, is that part of the military system is already considering getting uh, into this process. For instance, uh, soldiers and cadets would be well, would agree to to contribute to the pension system, uh, uh, but on the other side, generals would ask. Uh, to receive incomes, uh, the same income as ministers in Brazil. So that would reduce the economy, the savings you make on this. Uh, they would not accept as well uh, reducing their full retirement uh, pensions. So that could be also another another obstacle in this, in this path. Again, uh, everyone is talking about the pension reform for a long time. The elections are gone, so now politicians can feel more comfortable to address the issue before the elections. Uh, that could be dodgy because this is not a popular uh, 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 topic amongst the, among the society. So uh, uh, I expect this, this to happen in the next months, but I'm not sure if these sensitive topics will be addressed as they should. So uh, expected to happen, a lot of sensitivity <coughs> around it. 
how does it happen then? Uh, how do you, I mean, this is bedeviled uh, multiple governments. We, we hosted uh, earlier this year a high ranking official from the Time administration who was very optimistic that we were going to get uh, pension reform in, in, in 2018. And, and you know, we're, we're here in November 1 in 2018 and there is, there is no pension reform. So how, 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 does, how does this move forward given all the very entrenched interests and in not changing different aspects of the system? Well, one, you need a proposal, right? So, so you know, so we're we're talking about also a, an elected government that's you know we're not even a week into right. into there having right. been having won the election. Right. We're in the process of putting together an ec a broader economic team, and then you have to be dialoguing with the president elect and, and coming up with a uniform proposal and an approach, etc. And and that does not happen overnight. Um, so that's the, the first step is to actually come up with you know, ideas that you can advance. Backing up, no pension reform is popular. Anywhere globally, Brazil, yep. we're having, period, okay? Right. It's not a vote getter, okay? Right. Um, the, 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 the fiscal reality, I think, we believe will push something. Again, the, at what exact, in what form, at what pace, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but the, the Temer administration did do a lot of work in increasingly sensitizing one, the, the Congress, um, it had significant outreach. What are the issues? What is the fiscal reality here? They also outreach with all of the candidates and the economic teams of all the, the, the candidates, okay, to what is the economic reality, the fiscal reality. Then you have a campaign that had been underway in terms of it, it, um, educating more the, the population in terms of the inequities in the system because while you, there's the public regime for public workers and private workers and um, there, you know, the, et cetera. Now, what in the end comes out um, is, is really is the question, but you have to form, first have a plan, and then there's the, the political articulation yeah. to sell that. So it's going to rely on the ec economic expertise, the pension expertise, as well as then the political expertise. Yeah. Um, Get get the plan, move that move that plan forward, and you know, and, and Mauricio, the pension reform, even if you're, um, you know, if you're if you're not in this audience here and a beneficiary of the Brazilian pension system itself, as Lisa is saying, it, it's so in important for the overall economic trajectory of Brazil and for moving out of the kind of the the, the economic doldrums that Brazil has been mired in for a number of years. Yeah, I mean that's why I'm optimistic about this thing. I mean, there's no other way. I mean, there's no other way of governing without you know uh, going through a pension reform. It's already forty percent of the budget. It's going to be you know eighty percent in ten years. So I mean, th th there's no way you can avoid this issue. Uh, and, and of course, I mean, the, the, they're going to have. I mean, the president's going to have you know the honeymoon period has the second party in the Congress. I'm sure that, you know, the so-called central, you know, the center uh, parties are, are going to be, you know, joining as they always do. Uh, you know, even the, you know, the, the left of the center parties, the PSDB, I mean, uh, are probably are going to support this kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to happen. We don't know exactly what kind of proposal it's going to be approved. But I, I, as Lisa said before, I mean, that's not going to be enough to, you know, right. I mean, this is something, you know, the, the, the savings are going to be in the medium to long term. It's going to be important to, to put us, you know, in a sustainable path, you know, uh, uh, to avoid Lisa downgrading us one, one, one more time. S&P. <laughs> uh, it's not Lisa, right? It's not Lisa. Sorry, <laughs> S&P. Uh, but uh, you know, you have to add other you know uh, measures to try to close the gap, uh, and that's you know, that's not going to be easy as well because there's yeah. all these rigid uh, expenditures, earmark expenditures. So you're going to have to look for things like you know reducing uh, tax exemptions. You're going to have to reduce. Uh, at least in real terms, public sector wages. Mm -hmm. I mean, the premium in the public sector is about seven, 67 percent. You know, if, if you compare with wages in similar positions in the private sector. So, I mean, you're gonna have to raise taxes. I'm sorry, somehow. I mean, people talk about you know raising uh, taxes on uh, uh, income tax on, on you know the the the. The, the, the wealthiest people on, on capital gains. I mean, there's going to be, uh, it's going to have to be a collection of, of, of measures to try to at least, I mean, Paulo Guedes mentioned this target of zero uh, uh, primary uh, 
uh, deficit right. next right. year, which is sounds you know too optimistic to me. But uh, you know, at least put us you know in, in, you know yeah. has something to to work towards, have a north there, right. and he's going to have to rely on other measures other than pension reform. So Bruce, I want to turn back to Lisa, and Lisa, as you're responding to that and adding additional points, I want to throw one other thing in the, in, into the mix for you, which is uh, privatizations. Uh, Bolsonaro and Guedes have not always seen eye to eye on, on, on privatizations. Um, to what degree can we expect privatizations to be implemented, uh, uh, and what would be the impact of those privatizations on Brazil's economic outlook? As you're also uh, responding to uh, Mauricio's points, uh, especially since he brought uh, S and P into his into his comments there. Sure. Uh, point I, I wanted to go back to echo the 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 gentleman from the audience in the sense that if you look back, Brazil has done pension reforms. It does piecemeal over time as the pressures become right too 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 you know um, too much on the fiscal position, right? They've done it in the late '90s, uh, President uh, with, under Cardozo. They did it un, in, with Lula at the beginning of his first term, etc. So this would be another iteration. I would expect. I think the, the base case is for for continued adjustment in the pay uh, in the generous pay as you go system, yeah. and it's an issue not just at the federal level. And this is a point I wanted to add in. It's at the local government level. And so it's a matter of then, can you harness further buy-in from the local government levels whose budgets are suffering as well from the same rigidities in terms of payroll and pensions? And you see the, the, the difficulties in the state of Rio de Janeiro yeah. that has come yeah. very much from that. Switching to the privatization front, um, I think you it, clearly there are different signals that have been sent by different members of the that's where where will you come out at the end of the day that's what we'll be looking for mm -hmm. there's an mm -hmm. important difference for us campaign rhetoric versus policy implementation signaling execution etc from once in office that's an important point a caution we take for any election it for any sovereign across the rating scale yeah. um, and so what will be the outcome I think we, we remains to be seen our base case is s p is you're not going to have a massive uh, transformation with privatizations across the board. For one reason, that I mean, Petrobras has been privatized. Yeah. Let's look at, okay, it is, there, you know, there's a significant private ownership. Things have changed within the company, and you, you went from more intervention from the state, which has a share, now back to less intervention and more independence in the current configuration. A key issue moving forward for Petrobras, what will happen to the non-core assets? And this is what our corporate team has, has highlighted. What's going to happen to the pricing policy? Those are the kind of things. Um, I don't think one would think key state-owned banks would be privatized. Maybe portion, the, the, part, the insurance arm of Kaisha, which was discussed with, with President Temer, et cetera. But I think our, our base case is, yes, you will, could have some movement. But some of these key, some of the key assets, our base case is not. Yeah. They never were. And it's not, it, it doesn't. Um, there's not a tradition of that, so to speak, within the across the, the but from from Brazilian um, choices. I'm trying to think the right word here. The, right. the, the what the electorate prefers is more of a state presence. Yeah. Now, how you can harness that into an efficient state presence that delivers health, education, uh, and quality. That's what the the population is looking for more than say having everything privatized. Right. right. Now, now, Ricardo Bolsonaro has strongly argued in favor of actually shrinking the size of the state, right? Um, he sees the state as, as too large uh, in, 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 in practice. What does, this, what does this mean for Brazilians? What, what would a, a, if this idea of, of a shrinking the state really pans out, and again, as Lisa said, campaign rhetoric is different from policy implementation or, what's, or, or policy proposals put forward, but what, what would a, a shrinking the state look like potentially for Brazilians? Yes, this uh, has been a strong demand from at least part of the Brazilian population uh, since, I would say, uh, the process that has taken uh, former President Dilma Rousseff impeachment. Uh, and it got uh, stronger since the corruption scandals came up and since the population feels that the taxpayer money is not being well spent by the country. A reduction on the number of, of ministries, for instance, would be uh, a, a number one concern for, for a lot of people. President Temer reduced uh, the number of, of ministries from 32 to 23, and Bolsonaro says he will do it, uh, we reduce it for, to 15. 
uh, I don't know if we had in history uh, so a, a, a small number like this yeah. in ministries. Uh, this is not his biggest challenge, I would say. Ministries can be distinguished or unified by what we call uh, MPs, uh, uh, um, provisional measures. Um, and they must be voted in the Congress within 45 days. Otherwise, all the other uh, votes in the Congress are, are locked. So uh, if, if there is political will for this, this is not something that will be very hard for him. But in the same time, there are also controversies. For instance, uh, 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 turning the uh, Environment mis Ministry and the Agriculture right. Ministry into one, that could be a problem for yeah. in the vision of many people. Yeah. Now, before we move <coughs> on to, I want to move on to the U.S.-Brazil relationship and also Brazil's broader global uh, uh, commercial relationships. But one thing, one thing that's come out throughout our discussion thus far, which we haven't yet drilled down on, is the role of Congress. Um, in, in, this, in this last election, in the, in the lower house, for example, Bolsonaro's party, the PSL, the Social Liberal Party, um, back in 2014, it had elected just one federal de deputy uh, in 2014, currently has eight. Uh, now it's going to be the second most represented party with 52 deputies uh, in the in the lower house, actually just behind the PT, which has which has 56. Uh, numbers are not as good in, in the Senate, but how does uh, what does that process of um, of kind of coalition building look like potentially uh, for the PSL uh, uh, to be able to uh, you know is, is 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 you know not the dominant party in Congress to be able to move forward uh, policy I think uh, we were talking earlier in the panel about the uh, about parties coming on to the uh, to the uh, to the coalition that will be formed but how do, how do you see this is so any of these changes we're talking about um, uh, the, the role of Congress is going to be so vital, it's go, especially going back to things like pension reform. So, how, how what, what's what's the what's the key ingredient to actually being able to get policy uh, uh, through through Congress, and, and how do you see that playing out? Um, I'll I'll maybe start with you, Mauricio, since you're the you're, you're you've been um, uh, you're you're, you're the, playing the role of optimist on this on, on the panel. Well, I mean, I'm not a political scientist, so uh, you know. Um, uh, what I would say is that, I mean, uh, historically what has happened after elections is that, uh, you know, the, the, the center, I mean, particularly this MEDB, you know, the, 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 this people that, uh, you know, <coughs> always, uh, always try to be in power, you know, they, they're probably going to join uh, Bolsonaro at least, you know, uh, at the beginning of the administration. And, uh, and that will be a powerful force to try to push through those reforms mm -hmm. uh, to, to, through Congress. I mean, if, even the, you know, Bolsonaro's party, you know, is, is going to be benefiting from, another, from a lot of the other smaller parties that didn't uh, manage to go through right. the threshold right. in terms of, uh, of voting. So it's going to be bigger than it's, it is right now, and uh, he's going to be, be be benefited from the opportunists of uh, you know that, that you know that they always want to be in the government, and uh, you know as long as he's popular, and uh, you know uh, I think that uh, you know if he uses this political capital wisely. He can clearly push yeah. this thing through. I mean, uh, is, is something I, I think it would do something like uh, you know he should be something like different than uh, what Macri did in Argentina. Yeah. You, know, you need to you know start with the, the with the bad stuff yeah. and, and you know uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. if, if you, has, has, uh, have you priced this in the the ability to actually work with Congress to move forward? How, how, how does well, it? Going back, our downgrade in January was that. It's going. We, we felt anyone who is going to win, it, it's going to be it harder, right? Given what's happened in, in the in the across the political landscape, um, not that it's not. We're not saying it's not going to happen, but the outcomes probably would take a little bit more time. It it is always challenging to build coalitions in Brazil. You need strong political articulation coming from. Plan Alto, the, the entire executive administration, um, and then the traditional way of doing business with Congress it, it, in Brazil has been, you know, different cabinet positions, positions within government, the typical kind of you quote unquote pork barrel style. Yeah. 
that has a rejection from the population, and right, that's been since you know the last number of years then as an outcome of the Lava Jato. So how do you how do new fresh faces in Congress, of which you highlighted the amount of turnover no. and turnover with new faces with no experience, and a view from the administration that you're going to tap into these kind of instruments less? How do you build that? That's that's where certainly articulation and selling ideas will come into play. And we just think it it it's not going to be easy. It's never easy. So it it is a challenge. So we're 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 here in, in Washington. Uh, those via webcast are probably dis are dispersed, but. One key uh, Sunday night, uh, President Trump uh, uh, congratulated Bolsonaro um, uh, in, a, in a very in a, in a effusive way. Uh, Bolsonaro has talked about already about his first foreign trips, uh, with the U.S. being part of that. Um, what what ways, Lisa, do you see Bolsonaro potentially working with President Trump with the U.S. administration? To strengthen the U.S.-Brazil economic relationship, um, uh, what 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 opportunities I exist? Uh, you know, given the fact that there's been you know much discussion about a real seeing of eye to eye between the incoming Brazilian administration on a number of issues, as well as the U.S. administration. I think you know um, Brazil has had a I would say throughout various governments. Uh, here and there, strong ties and rapport with with the U.S. and in different ways, right? That 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 has evolved. I think the cha the challenges we see is, or I would say, both uh, both the U.S. and Brazil are closed economies. Okay, so that's one point. So how can you, for for Brazil, potentially opening up further? The U.S. X number of years ago, and I don't remember exactly when, but in my Earlier years of coming Brazil, Brazil, the U.S. was the top kind of you know export market, or you know that's not the case right, anymore. Right. Um, China at the top of the list in Brazil because of commodities, it's, et cetera. Um, so, you know, as Brazil is looking potentially from signs to broadening more of you know tr trade beyond, as the Temer administration was interested in too, beyond um, the region. But and beyond the southern cone to be a Pacific alliance or what have you, the U.S. could come back on the table. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we the the U.S. is in a, uh, interested less in, in global trade um, agreements per se, and is more interested in bilateral agreements. What that may play out in it is a very open question. But um, I would say that Brazil is not on the top of the U.S. trade agenda, yeah, per se. Right. So you can have a working relationship, and there's strong FDI ties between yeah, both countries. I think sure. that's probably the route that, that I would think um, kind of continuing to move forward. Um, if you look at the stock of FDI in Brazil and, and the share of the, the presence historically of the U.S. there, um, I think that that's certainly a, a key channel besides a particular trade agreement mm -hmm. at this point in time. And, and, and uh, I'm going to go uh, Mauricio and Ricardo, and then we'll go open up to, to questions. So start to think of your of your of your questions, um, Mauricio. Um, I guess two points. One is on the trade agreement. There's there there are other other types of uh, commercial agreements that can be had between the U.S. and Brazil rather than a, a full blown. Uh, we don't uh, a full blown trade agreement, um, but also on the point of China that Lisa just made. China is Brazil's number one trade partner. Uh, President -elect Bolsonaro has cautioned against China quote unquote buying Brazil uh, rather than buying in Brazil. Um, so where, where do you how do you see with Chinese investments in Latin America on the rise, which is a lot of work that uh, uh, we've done in the in the Asian Arts Latin America Center. What can we expect from a Bolsonaro administration vis-a-vis -vis China? And also, do you see the potential for other types of commercial agreements to be had? Where does that exist between the U.S. and, and Brazil? Look, I, I think. I mean, at first there, there's going to be a lot of rhetoric. I mean, especially because I think Bolsonaro will try to dif differentiate its foreign policy from those of you know the Workers' Party administration that saying that they were ideo ideologically driven, weren't taking into account Brazilian commercial interests. So this stuff about the BRICS, you know, this kind of. Uh, 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 stance. I think that uh, he's gonna, and, and he's already doing that no? by you know uh, saying that he's gonna align with the U.S. I mean, at least in, in, in more broad ideological terms and supporting of the you know uh, market economy, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, free speech, th this kind of thing. Uh, 
But uh, I think, I mean, or at least I hope we don't know exactly who's going to be. I mean, we don't know yet who's going to be the, you know, the foreign minister. And, you know, this whole thing is, you know, still uh, being uh, decided. But I, 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 I think that in practice what's going to happen is, especially in, on, on the trade uh, side, on, on trade policy terms, is that uh, he's going to be, he's going to have to be very pragmatic, uh, with China, I mean, as, as Lisa said, it's already you know uh, the, the Brazil largest partner. Uh, you don't want to antagonize uh, China, you know, uh, uh, based purely on ideological issues. I, I all hope he will be more pragmatic uh, on this uh, on this grounds. But uh, I, I would also hope that uh, you know the the policy towards China would be more. Uh, uh, realistic. You know, I think what, what has happened in the last 10, 20 years was pretty much driven, you know, and I think Bolsonaro was right, by ideology. You know, the commercial interests weren't put on the table. People wouldn't discuss, for instance, all the, you know, the, the restrictions Embraer was having. You know, it was forced to build planes in China to be able to sell planes over there, all the, you know, trade barriers imposed on agricultural goods, you know, and, and these things, uh, you know, it need to be put on the table. I mean, uh, and I, I hope that uh, this would happen. It's already happening. I think term Temer already start moving in that direction. Uh, for instance, for the first time, Brazil is taking China to the WTO mm -hmm. uh, with the, the sugar restrictions that were imposed and it's fine and Brazil took the US to the WTO because of the cotton and you know, there wasn't a crisis a bilateral crisis because of that I mean it's, it should be treated as a normal trade relations yeah. it's something that happened all the time and the US I mean uh, I am not very hopeful that uh, you know something like a, a full FTA it's on the cards Especially uh, by looking what has happened with renegotiation I, I of don't NAFTA. We don't call them FTAs anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, the, the type of uh, you know things that you see in the new NAFTA or whatever you want to call it, I don't think it's something that uh, you know is in the interest of Brazil. Mm -hmm. But there's other uh, you know areas where you can work, and, and they're already working you know on that. For instance, on trade facilitation, mm -hmm. on standards. So there are things you we can really move forward on. You know. Uh, the thing of visas and facilitating, you know, uh, movement of, of business people. There's an agenda there to, to, to work on, but not. I, I wouldn't be too ambitious about, you know. And Ricardo, just the last question before over to the to, pet, to the audience is, um, and Mauricio has referenced it, the 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 cost of Brazil, right? The the cost of doing business in Brazil that has really um, impeded, I think, a, a, you know, investment, but it's um, kind of the commercial trajectory. How likely is um, I mean, Brazil remains one of the most expensive countries to do business with? Uh, how likely is that to to change in the next administration? And and what what would be maybe one or two, it may be easier to deliver uh, 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 changes in Brazil that would that would decrease the cost uh, of, of doing business? Yeah, um, I was asking myself the same and. And as a journalist, I, I, I looked for someone who understands it better than me. Yesterday, I talked to former uh, U.S. ambassador in Brazil, Thomas Shannon, mm -hmm. and I asked this question, and he's quoted Tom Jobim, the musician. He said, Brazil is not for beginners, and he also said, uh, Brazil is not for the ones in a hurry. So uh, he did not see any uh, close uh, solutions for this. He said that Brazil, yes, is a hard country to invest in. Uh, uh, there is an index, an interesting index that puts us among 100, 180 countries. We, we are the one, uh, 153 uh, closest country in the world. Uh, but he also says- Is this, is this the, doing, the doing business index? Yeah. yeah. But he also says that uh, it is possible to invest in Brazil. There are American companies in the country for more than 100 years doing well. Uh, so uh, I, I cannot bring any, any practical solution in the short term. But I think it has to do with political will, with uh, uh, an effort for dialogue as well. So um, yeah, that remains to be seen. I, I just wrote down that, that, that quote you just gave. Brazil is, is not for beginners. Um, let me take questions from the audience. 
There's a number. I'm going to take a couple of them together. Uh, if you could say uh, fourth row, just on the aisle here, please, first. And if you could just state your name and, and affiliation. Uh, hi, I'm Pat Host from Jane's. Uh, I'm wondering how the new president might affect Brazil's military spending or perhaps military trade, and how might he impact the Bro Boeing Embraer negotiations? Great, thanks, Pat. Military spending. Um, we'll take uh, three. We'll take this question here, and then and we'll take uh, Cassie over here. So. Hi, thanks. I'm Carlos Gustavo Poggio. I'm a Brazilian visiting scholar at the Department of Government in Georgetown University. I have two quick questions. First, there is already a pension reform plan in the Congress right now. It should be voted. And I think Temer said that if Bolsonaro wants it to be voted, he will try to get it through Congress uh, this year. What, what do you think is the possibility of this happening? Uh, and the second question is, uh, um, I mean, considering all the comparisons between Trump and Bolsonaro, if you think about Trump, uh, his number one advisor, super strong man, was Stephen Bannon before he won the election. And Stephen Bannon didn't last a year in the Trump administration. So my question, my question is, how long do you think Paulo Guedes will last in a Bolsonaro administration? <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Pension reform and the prognostic on Paulo Guedes. Uh, uh, Cassia. Thank you, Cassia Carvalho, Brazil U.S. Business Council. So my question is also about pension reform. I agree that likely we'll have some kind of reform in the first six months to a year, but con considering that it's been so watered down, and if we do have a watered down reform that is passed in Congress and the Bolsonaro administration uses its political capital to pass it, is it going to resolve Brazil's uh, fiscal problem in the long term? So they use political capital. It still does not resolve the fiscal crisis that mm -hmm. we have. Great. Thanks, Kasia. So two questions on the pension reform, water, uh, uh, the current plan in Congress, uh, whether water, what the effects of a watered-down version, uh, question on military spending, and then we're also going to look ahead at Paul Gates' future and how long he might stay in the, in the administration. Lisa, do you want to, you want to start on pension? Yeah, I'll tackle the pension. Um, <clears throat> you have different signals, right? And then that's, again, we're a lot of fluidity. Again, the, the president-elect, he got won the election on Sunday, right? In terms of will you, and he, my understanding, and I might have missed something, he's meeting with President Temer next week. Um, will they push what's sitting already sitting in Congress? Unclear. Again, there have been mixed signals on that. Our base case has been you, you really would wait for a new administration to see action on a pension reform, given you know, the, the turnover, the changes in Congress, et cetera. And, and realistically, there is a short per period of time of voting days towards the end of the year. But you know, it's not clear. It will depend on the political articulation. Yeah. In terms of you know, will it solve the, the no, in, in the sense that I think our base case is you're going to have piecemeal pension reform as you have had mm -hmm. okay and the reform that was put on the table even in its initial carnation was not going to be solving the you know the it, it, there's not one panacea okay it, it's probably an iterative approach um, there was watering down but um, the way we're looking at it we're not looking at the 50-year horizon when we're looking at the rating and what the, the net present value savings that you're getting we're going to be looking more in the closer term the nearer term mm -hmm. how does it contain spending growth give you some more space in the budget to meet the cap um, to help at the local government level as well so where are some of balancing some of the nearer term benefits is it closing some of the 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 benefits that you can can give some fiscal relief not just in 50 years but sooner as, as well um, so I think that those would really be the the, the the key points that I would you know want to highlight there great thank you uh, other point pension reform also the military spending and Ricardo, I'll probably turn to you on the on the the, the political outlook and on 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 Paulo's uh, future in, in the administration, um, uh, but but also this question on military spending and, and how we could ex expect that to uh, be impacted in this next administration. Yeah, I would start with the military investment. What we know so far is that this will become. Uh, uh, a main concern for Mr. Bolsonaro. It wasn't in the last, in the previous administrations. Uh, President Trump has mentioned this 
on his tweet about his, his call with Mr. Bolsonaro improving our, our military relations, our military exchanges. Uh, what, what I heard from, from Bolsonaro's aides is that yes, this is a priority, and politically, this is uh, this would be a priority as well. They have a very, very uh, 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 dramatic uh, uh, aspiration. They they would like to have a seat at NATO. That's what I heard from 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 Bolsonaro's aides and uh, uh, Ambassador Shannon has mentioned it as well. He actually supports it. He, this is something very. Uh, distance from now, this is unlikely, I would say, but that shows an intention, at least, to to straighten uh, the Brazilian military forces. Paulo Guedes. Paulo Guedes. It's really hard to predict. Uh, um, we don't know. The government hasn't started. Uh, we don't know what the cabinet who is in the cabinet. Well, we're still waiting for a confirmation, for instance, for, for Justice uh, Sergio Moro, who's now uh, talking to, did it come? Is it confirmed? Oh, yes. good to know. Con <laughs> confirmed so, yeah. over the course of this discussion. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So I have a lot of work to do today. Next Minister of Justice. Wow. Well. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is still ongoing, right? We don't know exactly who's going to be in the cabinet, uh, but I agree with you. This is something we cannot uh, uh, be sure. Uh, so let's see. Uh, yeah, let's take uh, these three questions uh, together. Actually, we'll just kind of lump them together um, and then respond, and, th and then turn over to Bart to get provide closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Diogo Coelho. I'm from the Brazilian Embassy. Uh, nice seeing you again, Lisa. Uh, um, my question is for you. Um, besides, uh, I know that pension reform and um, government payroll are two big chunks of the Brazilian budget. But what other um, aspects of um, fiscal adjustments do you see as necessary to move forward taking um, not into consideration, I mean, those big, two big issues. Um, do you see any other areas that would need uh, further attention from uh, for the future government? And there is just one minor uh, correction also, because yesterday the new Doing Business Index was uh, released and Brazil went up 16 positions, and it's oh. currently number 109. Wow, great, thank you for clarifying that. We'll do, actually, we'll just do these two questions again so that we, uh, I always like to make sure that we end on time. Uh, so we'll take these two questions and then, and then turn over to, to Bart. Yeah. Okay. Bom dia. I'm Marjorie Macieira. I'm a chair of an independent consultant network. And my question is for you, Ricardo, as a media person. I think since Trump has taken over here, there's been tension between the media and the president. And I'm wondering in Brazil, what do you think the relationship between the media and Bolsonaro will be, and in terms of transparency and the fake news, that whole thing that's going on here, what do you project for the future in Brazil? Okay. Uh, you, would you like to start with that, with that, Ricardo, and then we'll go to Lisa and Bruce, if you want to jump in, please do, but. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, we hope it's a good uh, relationship. It has not been so far, I would say. Uh, uh, although Bolsonaro is, insists in, in his defense on the press freedom in the country. He did not participate or engage in, in the debates during, during uh, uh, the elections. Uh, he did not engage in press conferences or uh, in as many press conferences as his opponents uh, did during the elections. Uh, he is targeting a few uh, media outlets in Brazil as uh, opponents saying that they have a political bias towards him. Folha de São Paulo newspaper is, is an example. Folha de São Paulo brought a few uh, 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 questions about his, his campaign. He brought, they brought that uh, WhatsApp uh, 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 alleged scheme uh, connecting it to Bolsonaro com Bolsonaro's campaign. And he says that, that Folha is, is working against him. But the same folia brought the Mensalon scandal up. The same folia had a very uh, in-depth coverage of Lava Jato, which he uses a lot in his campaign. So this, this 
could be a sort of a, a contradiction. Uh, the newspaper that helps me, that helps him uh, 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 criticizing his opponents, uh, is also a bad newspaper because it talks uh, about him as well. Uh, I'm not defending Folia here. Uh, I'm just bringing uh, something that I think is important. Freedom for the press is not something that you that you just uh, defend, that you just say you support. You have to show it in practice, and. Uh, what I would recommend is, as you said, transparency, accountability. We're here to, to show good things, but also to, to find problems. That's how the press works in the whole, in the whole world. And uh, uh, we make a lot of mistakes, I'm sure uh, we do. Uh, and the beautiful part of it is that there is space for people to criticize us, and we will try to, to, to do our job better. But um, I would expect Mr. Bolsonaro to talk more to the press, to be more open for us, not only in the rhetoric side. Uh, Lisa, other, other fiscal adjustments? Yeah. So clearly, <coughs> besides payroll and pension, you know, you, you, there are the, the, the share of discretionary spending in the budget has continued to shrink. Um, so that includes investment spending, new capital projects. To the degree that you can still find efficiencies in, in there in certain discretionary programs, yes. But then there are other programs where potentially efficiencies could be found. The Temer administration did a lot of work on the FIES program for, as an example. I'm just giving that an example. Taking a look at different programs and policies um, in, in the, 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 that other chunk of the, the you know, um, non-discretionary, sorry, in the, in the, in the non-discretionary area. Um, then obviously interest payments can take, take a, a big portion of the budget. To improve the overall fiscal story, right, so I'm going to get to the revenue side, you know, policies to reduce debt, uh, have more favorable outcomes are going to help alleviate the interest burden over time from our point of view. You take the risk premium out, etc., and you have bring down the stock of debt. Um, then there's clearly the revenue side of, of the budget, and as um, <coughs> Mauricio has already highlighted, um, Brazil has lo long standing had a complicated uh, and distortionary tax regime. State taxes, federal taxes, what have you. But you have introduced further distortions under the Rousseff administration with various exemptions across sectors, et cetera, not all of which have been uh, eliminated, or many of them have not been eliminated, despite some attempts by the Temer administration. There's, I would say there's more porousness in the Brazilian tax system. Um, and that weighs on the revenue collection. But then there's the overall, there's the growth story, right? And I wanted to come back to that, that picking up on the privatization right, piece. Right. Privatization, again, we don't see big you know, strategic assets going, but yeah, we think there is scope for privatization. We put out a piece on this earlier this week. To the degree that you add more space for private investment in the Brazilian economy and exports, that's the way to strengthen the growth story. So it's hitting the Custo Brasil, it's improving the fiscal story, more and, and various other pieces of, of micro-oriented legislation. A stronger growth picture is going to help give you space on the fiscal side. Bruce, do you, do you want to add anything? If not, we'll turn it over to... I want to give you a chance if you want to. Yeah, add. just a quick. Uh, I mean, on, on military spending, I think the short answer is there's no money. So uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> no matter how you know favorably he sees um, you know increasing military spending, the fiscal situation clearly doesn't allow any you know big increases on, on that side. On the question of Paulo Guedes, I think it's. it's the question is in everybody's mind because there is this mismatch between Bolsonaro's record, which is pretty much the kind of uh, you know uh, voting uh, consistent of the mindset of the military of the 70s, interventionist, you know, voting against uh, things like uh, you know real plan, and, and 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 you have Paulo Guedes, which is more of a liberal economist, and so. But my 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 take on that is. He has no other option uh, uh, other than having uh, uh, a minister with uh, Paulo Guedes' profile. I mean, uh, in, uh, as we said before, I mean, uh, you need to do the, the fiscal adjustments. It's a matter of, of life and death. So, uh, you know, the, the state we are discussing here, why Brazil is so expensive, 
the state in Brazil has become a burden. I mean, it's more of a hindrance than a help. I mean, it, it, it's clearly at the root of all the fiscal problems we are having now. You know, this idea that uh, you know there has been uh, you know uh, very uh, resilient and, and, and difficult to die. This idea that the state can do everything, that the state can allocate uh, you know resources better than the private sector, and, and it has been a disaster. So I mean, getting out of this thing, you need somebody that will push in the, this direction of reforming the state, of improving the way that the, the state, you know, uh, collect taxes, you know, collect revenue. As Lisa was saying, we need, uh, you know, f uh, tax reform. We need to move towards, away from cascading taxes towards, you know, something like a VAT. You know, we need to improve the way that the government is spending money, you know, all these uh, you know, programs, you know, we spend at least 30% of the, the revenue on programs uh, on corporate welfare, you know, supporting the private sector, and we not even know if those programs are effective or not. So there's a lot of things to do on that side, and, and also on the re regulatory side. I mean, we need to improve, you know, the, the way that the government regulates, the state regulates the private sector. Thank, uh, thank you, Mauricio. Now I want to turn over to. We'll stay here on the stage and invite Bart Osterville to come up, the director of the Global Business and Economics Program. Bart now has the uh, easy task. Of, ta of taking all of these uh, discussion points uh, and providing us context moving forward. Uh, before Bart speaks, I want to again thank uh, Lisa, Mauricio, and Ricardo for this uh, incredibly uh, insightful uh, panel discussion. R uh, really uh, appreciate that, and, and I know that everyone else here does. Okay, thank you, Jason. And uh, let me add my thanks to the panelists. My, my observation when it comes to Brazil's economy and economic prospects, uh, market observers are usually either in a panic or in a euphoric state, and uh, they're both wrong. And I think we picked up uh, a lot of nuance and a lot of uh, constructive policy ideas here. I think the, the the key topics and the key challenges are well known and were highlighted by the panelists, I think, and on the fiscal side, on the pension reform side. Um, just to remind ourselves uh, of the importance of Brazil to the global economy. It's you know, the, an economy the size of Italy's and France's. And uh, for regional economic prospects, it is critical that, uh, that Brazil's economy uh, performs well. So uh, let me end then in terms of this optimism and pessimism uh, on, on a cautiously optimistic note. I think uh, some of the reforms that, that Lisa has uh, outlined and some of the ideas um, that the incoming administration appears to be working on are the correct uh, analysis of the issue. Now, whether this will lead to, uh, to constructive uh, policy reform and, and political reform remains to be seen. But everything from improving the tax administration to trade liberalization and opening up uh, the economy more um, uh, to making it an easier place to invest, I think, are, are, are critically important. One final note, because we, we started down the discussion on China but never really uh, fully got there. What Brazil probably cannot have, given the current U.S. administration, is a deep economic integration with China and the U.S. at the same time. Uh, I don't think that's where the Trump administration sees the economic world order headed. So. Um, I'll end with that. I want to thank you for joining us here at the Council this morning. I thank again our panelists and Jason for an excellent panel. Thank you, Bart. And, uh, and, and I see in the back of the room uh, Roberta Braga, the Associate Director of the Adrian Arts Latin America. So thank you, Roberta. And Roberta has an op-ed out in the Hill today on the role of disinformation in the Brazilian election. So thank you all for, for, for this great discussion today.